Yeah. All right. Are we are we live, Larissa? We're ready to go. Yep. I want to wait for people to, if they're going to put their videos on or give them a minute to audio connecting. I see a lot of connecting to audios. I'm a people. Everybody's a people. <laughs> You're people too. <laughs> I'm a people. I'm a reader. people. We're all a people. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Hello there, Mikey. <laughs> How you doing? See everybody now. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hey. Hey. Good to see all of you. Here they everybody come. Everybody making it through COVID? Yeah, we made it. That's good. Mostly. Yeah, mostly. That didn't sound good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, Steve. Kathy Canary, Mrs. K. Wells, my hero. Uh, say again. I say Caddy Canary. Yes. And Mrs. K. Wells, uh. my hero, my heroes. <laughs> hey. Hey, Kate. Hey. Mm -hmm. Who's been fish friend? Fish friend. That's kind of funny. Some people don't have their um uh, on, put a shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my husband was working in the garage. You you see me? It's going to be that kind of a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can see me. <laughs> well, we did it. We did it in that moment. <laughs> we've got it. We've got an image burnt into the brain now. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you're on or off. All right, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to mute, John. Uh, Don't forget to mute your mic. Oh, there's Mohammed. <laughs> yeah. And there's Louise. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you guys going to record this? Yes. Yes, it's being great. recorded. Great, great. Oh, you start already. Well, it's 6.31. Um, Kay, do you want to tell us a little bit about Jack and get started? Okay. Um, Jack is a very good nature photographer. He teaches at Valencia College, and his pictures have been in numerous publications by Audubon, and um, he's um, been doing workshops for a number of years now. He was my first teacher of nature photography. And I pulled some boners in his first class, but I learned things. <laughs> and um, he's one of the best photographers of shorebirds that I know. So it's, uh, you, will, you will get some helpful hints tonight. Okay. Right, so uh, hello everybody. So um, what we could do as we go through this is just you know have a conversation. And I'm, I'm planning on looking at um, techniques for photographing shorebirds and then uh, a little bit of maybe spend a little time at uh, identifying some shorebirds like it, that can be really difficult but you know we can look at some of the basic uh, ways that help you identify some of the shorebirds and in a few places you might go that that you know there's some good places near St. Augustine but some other places too that you may or may not have, not have visited so so that's the that's the goal here so I'm gonna let's see if I can pull up my PowerPoint here and yeah, so um, oh, you know what? Yeah, I'm a rookie here. I probably need to share a screen. Yeah, let's see. There we go. All right. So you guys can see that now. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Do we need to yeah. uh, use the chat? It won't ask questions. Uh, no, I mean, you know, uh, I don't see everybody now because I'm looking at, let's see if I can fix my view here. So, okay, there's a different show grid, show small active speaker, and maybe no. Yeah, no, no, just throw, just, hey, Jack, and ask a question. That'll, 
That'll be the best thing to do. I'm going to sort of throw that off to the side. Okay, so, uh, but yeah, feel free to just verbally assault me. Say, hey, Jack, and then I'll be happy <laughs> to answer your questions. So, uh, you know, what the photo here shows is that uh, during the summer months, it's, boy, it's tough to photograph shorebirds or identify shorebirds because that's what they all look like. You ever heard that LBJ? What kind of bird is that? It's an LBJ. You ever heard that little brown jobber? Nobody knows because they all look the same because shorebirds are very distinct in, in that they develop very specific breeding colors and look awesome during the breeding season. But uh, during the winter, you know, the non-breeding season, not so much. They all look like that. So, so uh, right now is actually a really good time to, uh, to begin to identify shorebirds and photograph shorebirds in their breeding plumage before they migrate. So black belly plovers, if you see a black belly plover most of the year, that's kind of what they look like. And they don't have a black belly and there's nothing black about them. They're brown or white. And then the winter, they get a very distinct black belly. They get a black cap. They look beautiful. And maybe I'll, I think I have some pictures to show that. But uh, anyway, uh, photographing shorebirds. So some of the things to think about, some of the techniques that uh, I always like to apply. So anytime I'm doing photography, in fact, I, I, I uh, like going to the alligator farm. I don't just hop in the car and go. I, I'm looking at the weather because the, if you're photographing birds and trees, there's a lot of branches. So a lot of branches means bright light coming through the, through the, you know, and shadows from branches. And you can't photograph one of those birds there on a sunny day without having white spots behind them and stripes across them. And so if it's not uh, overcast, I don't go. So checking the weather is a really big piece of the story. So I wrote here, you know, time of day, time of year, nesting season, how to approach. Those are some of the things to touch on. So let's just touch on some of that. Time of day. Uh, what's the best time of day to photograph birds in general? I think it's, you know, when the sun's rising. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the, the color of the light. And, uh, and I have a couple of photos here that I hope demonstrate what I mean by color of light. So both of these are, a, you guys know what kind of bird that is? Is that a semi-palpitated plover? <laughs> Close, yeah. Semi-palmated, yeah. Semi oh, yeah. Yes. Sure. So very good. Uh, and uh, can you tell the color is different? This guy has golden light on it. And uh, the shadow is like, you can't see the shadow very distinctly because I'm, I'm very low here. I'm laying down. And the shadow runs for like a mile because the sun is very, very low behind me. And because it's hitting the atmosphere at an angle, the light is still golden. You know, it's that golden moment, first thing. The other bird, you can see its shadow very distinctly. It's a harsh black shadow. It's because the sun is high in the sky and it's shining down and the bird is between the sun and the, and the sand. So you get that very dark shadow. So it's bright white middle of the day daylight, right? Uh, a lot of guys, uh, me in particular, I like this kind of warm golden light that you get. Uh, you might prefer the white light, but then you're always gonna have to deal with shadows here. And then you're also gonna have to deal with the angle of the sun. Um, when the sun is low, you can position yourself very easily between your subject and the sun. And it's just like being in a studio with, with studio lights behind you. The sun is acting as a studio light. Uh, you can see that in this bird's eye right there. That's the sun reflected in his eye. And, uh, and like I said, the light is golden because it's very early in the morning and the shadow is very, very long. And here you can still see the birds, uh, the sun, but it's higher in his eye. Um, what will happen in a short time, is the sun will get so high that you won't see the sun reflected in his eye anymore. You won't have what's called a catch light. And then the eye turns black and then it almost looks like a stuffed bird, right? If you don't, that little bit of light in there, that little catch light gives it some life, right? And you always wanna see that if you can get that. So time of day to me is, uh, and there's other things, you know, generally the, uh, it's calmer, the sun's not up. So which means there's no rising air, which means there aren't any waves, there aren't any ripples, there's not much wind. Uh, birds, wildlife in general, tend to be more active when it's they're just it's dark and it's early. They've been resting. And as soon as the sun comes up, they start moving around and foraging. And then when it gets hot, they all disappear, uh, just like people right? they get out of the sun. So uh, time of day for any photography is significant. But for shorebirds, you know, if you're if you want to get the the color and you want to get them uh, on the beach when they're still active, it's early for me. You can go late too, but the problem with late is by the time, so it seems like if it's early, you get the light as soon as the sun comes up, 
And then you can judge for yourself. You might get an hour or two. You get more time during the winter because the sun stays lower in the sky. But uh, in the evening, if you go in the evening, it might be five o'clock and, and the light finally gets good and it's dark an hour later, you know, depending on the time of year. So early in the morning for me is the best. Time of year, so that's something you may or may not consider, but, but in Florida, this time of year, you, well, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of that all the time. I'm thinking about the light angles all the time. And if it's uh, winter, the sun is really, really low in the sky and it's coming across the south side of the sky, then you might be able to stay out and photograph all day long, almost, because the sun never gets really high in the sky and you never get the sun above you and you never get the shadow under the nose or under the bill or under the eyes because the sun is always low and so it's always acting like kind of like that studio light for you but uh, uh so that position of the sun is dictated by the time of the year and it can be very significant and uh, as we move into june and july the sun's going to be straight overhead and everything is going to have a shadow under it which means the, the bird's beak is going to have a shadow running right down the front of his body and his eyes, if they have deep sockets, they're going to be shadow. They're going to be shadow. And if the sun's low, none of that happens. So the time of year and the position of sun can be significant. And of course, weather and temperature. To me, um, shorebirds is sort of a, a default for summer. When it gets really hot, go to the beach, there's a little breeze and there's water nearby. And it's just a little cooler by the beach because of the evaporative effect of the water uh, and sea breezes. But, but uh, um, a big thing too is when it's summer and you're on the beach, then so are all the people. So really the best time for me is when there's nobody there and not just other photographers, but no one, because I've many times been on the beach and spent a lot of time positioning myself. And then uh, somebody walks through and chases the, you know, just inadvertently scares the birds away. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, if, I, if it's uh, my choice is Wednesday, or Sunday on the beach, it's always Wednesday because there's always going to be less people on the beach Wednesdays than there are on the weekends, right? And so time of year too, if it's if it's cold and, and uh, uncomfortable out there, then I'm going to go because I expect there won't be any beach showers there. Uh, it's just always anticipating what you want to accomplish, but also, you know, the other factors besides just, will I get lucky today? Nesting season is great for shorebirds, man, it's so good. And right now we're moving into the nesting season. And so, uh, you know, if you are familiar with all at all with some of Florida shorebirds, you know that, well, you guys probably know about Huguenot Beach Park. I guess most of you do. It's up north of Jacksonville and there are um, royal terns and there are least terns and there are laughing gulls and they nest there by the thousands, right? I mean, it's a great place you can get birds, guaranteed to get birds um, courting behavior and mating and um, bringing fish, the turns flying and exchange fish. And uh, it's, a, it's a really great place. So if I just threw that out there as if uh, I expected you guys to know about it. But if you don't know about it, check it out. Huguenot Beach Park. It's, uh, I think it's just on the north side of Jacksonville. Been a long time since I've been up there, but it's a great place for you guys to go and photograph birds. And, you know, shorebirds don't really make much of a nest. They just have a little scrape and they settle down in there, but you'll see them exchanging positions and the eggs underneath them as they exchange positions. And as, a, as they hatch, the babies, like in this picture here, this is a plover, Wilson's plover. And I don't know if you notice this, but that's a baby butt and a baby butt, and there are four little extra legs. The little plovers run around and then they're feeding, and as soon as they feel a little bit threatened, they'll run up and hide under their mom, which is, you know, too cute. So, um, you know, I love to get, shorebirds nesting and courting and raising chicks if you can. So nest season is a great place, great time to get good pictures of shorebirds. And the ones that nest commonly in Florida, they're shorebirds and seabirds. The shorebirds being the birds that live and feed, you know, on the beach. And the seabirds are the birds you'll see on the beach a lot, but mostly feed in the ocean, right? That's kind of the way I understand it's there, it's broken down. But plovers, we have lots of plovers in Florida and we'll look more at those later. Uh, the, the plovers that nest here are um, snowy plovers and Wilson's plovers. And you probably have Wilson's plovers nesting like Anastasia Island around there, I think even. I mean, they're very common, the most common plover. Um, you probably will find them on the beach in little scratch. And maybe very soon probably see them with babies. I, I think it's already starting to happen. 
May into May, June is is when you see a lot of that. Well, it's they're the they're the probably the most common bigger shorebird that you'll see on the beach, and and they nest around here. Oyster catchers, you guys, uh, I'll show you some pictures of these. But oyster catchers nest, and to me, they're like the the most wonderful shorebird to photograph because they got a big orange bill and and a ring around their eyes, and they're black and they're white, and they got these big clumsy looking goofy legs, and they're just very distinctive and interesting photograph. Now they nest here. So if you can find the oyster caster nets, and of course they'll be most often cordoned off and you, you don't want to disturb them at all, but, but it's a great opportunity. And killdare are shorebirds that don't really live on the shore. They're plovers. They're long-legged, fast-moving plovers. They look a, a bit like this guy, um, uh, but taller with black rings around their necks. And, um, but they don't frequent the beach as much as they do grassy, gravelly areas along the coastal areas. And then turns and laughing gulls and then black skimmers. And you can see all those at Huguenot if you go there. So um, I, uh, I like to go to the Florida Gulf Coast during the nesting season. In fact, I, I, Kate went on a trip with us uh, early on and we went to a little Estero Lagoon down by Fort Myers. And there was least turns and Wilson's plovers and there are snowy plovers down there nesting. And they're, they're consistent. They come back every year. So it's like a, a photo op that you can plan a vacation around which is kind of neat. There's the oyster catcher. So you guys recognize this bird, I imagine, but if you, if you haven't seen these guys, they're so, they're just very interesting looking. Um, uh, I'm talking about here now, thinking about uh, techniques for approaching shorebirds. So most shorebirds are predated from uh, air, right? Uh, a uh, peregrine falcon or a kestrel or even an eagle flies over uh, and they spot them and every bird on the beach flies away. And they don't go, hey, I wonder what that is. As soon as they see any unexpected motion, any profile uh, above them, they flush. That's their habit, you know? And, and uh, so if you are high and you come up from an angle where they don't really catch you, you're just walking up to them, they're gonna flush probably. And so what I've learned is if I spot a possible subject, I think about where's the sun and I want to put the sun behind me so that the sun is shining on my subject like studio lamps, right? I always tell people point your shadow because if the sun's behind you, that means your shadow then is going to be pointing right at your subject and it'll keep you in the right um, light angle. But uh, I, I position myself and then I move slowly and then when I think uh, the bird has noticed me, I lay down. I get down and literally crawl uh, slowly, and it's something that everybody can't do. But you can't even squat and, 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 and comfortably move without disturbing them, right? So literally, I'll, I'll get as close as I can get, lay down. Uh, I've got a 400-millimeter camera with a, what I call a little ground pod. It's really the, uh, the upper part of a pistol grip uh, tripod, and I hold that in my hand, and I low crawl. And sometimes you'll, you'll see me after I get done with a little photo session and look behind me and I've got this crazy path that I've crawled and as the bird has moved or something or I, I've shifted a little bit. But, but uh, because birds never get predated by a human crawling on the beach, they're not threatened by a human crawling on the beach. And, and that's how I got up to these guys. They were, they were resting on the beach. They saw me, but I'm not scary. And I'm moving slow and I get where I think, okay, I'm close enough. I can take a few photos. I'll take a few photos and then I'll, okay, maybe I can get a little closer and I'll crawl a foot. And if they get a little antsy, I'll just wait and let them get used to me and take a few more photos. And, and quite often you can feel your frame and the birds don't move. In fact, I've been laying on the beach like that and other birds have come in. And by the time I get done, there's birds all around and I don't even know how to go without scaring them. So I, you know, I'll slowly back out of there, but but if you can make yourself non-threatening and literally, if you can convince yourself to crawl, what will, there's two benefits. One is that you can get very close to your subject. The other is like in this photo, the background disappears. If you're standing up shooting down on a shorebird, you're gonna be shooting at mud and dirt and all the stuff around the shorebird. If you get down at his level, at eye level, then you, know, you can see where's the background, four miles away, so it's out of focus. So then you get this, right? You can see nothing in this picture except for the, the bird and this one's starting to go out of focus and back here there's nothing so it makes your subject float uh, 
because the background is out of, out of focus. And you know, if shorebirds start preening, chances are they are really going to get, they're going to enjoy that and they're going to let you get close. So make yourself unobtrusive and slowly move to them. And sometimes you can get really great pictures of birds pulling their feathers and all kinds of neat stuff because uh, that's one of the things they do. They just get, it feels good, I guess. And they just lose track of what's going on around them. Sometimes you can get really close. Love to get pictures of birds feeding. Uh, and what you'll learn is different. I'm looking for my cursor. Yeah, there you go. Uh, different birds have different habits. Turnstones, run around the beach and flip stuff over. Um, oyster catchers dig in the beach. If you see them digging, stop and wait because what they're likely to pull something out and they've got this flattened bill and they're going to spend some time trying to extract their food. And as you watch more birds, you'll get uh, more familiar with their habits and then get some great pictures that show behavior rather than just, you know, a, a static photo. Uh, where's the sun? So yeah, a lot of this stuff. But point your shadow is something I tell people all the time. Uh, you can see, I hope, the horizon right here, the sun in the bird's eye, and there's not a shadow to be seen anywhere here. And that's because uh, I'm laying down with the sun right behind me, and my shadow is, is probably 400 feet long, but very, very, very um, distinct because the sun is so low and the light's not harsh yet. Um, sometimes what has happened is I've been laying on the beach and crawling toward a little plover, and the plover's this tall, and I'm that tall, my head's that tall, so what will happen is the sun is right behind me, very low, and I'll, even though I'm only this tall, my shadow will get cast on the bird, and I'll have to shift to the left or the right a little bit so that it's now fully illuminated like that, but that's the photo that, that if it's a static portrait, that's what I would love to always have. Catch light in the bird's eye, uh, an out of focus background. This is really, really nasty, gooey, crummy looking mud. And if I was standing up taking a picture of this, all that would be in the picture. But it's gone because I'm low. And you can see there's about an inch of depth of field. The depth of field is just enough, even though the bird's tail's a little bit out. So the depth of field goes from here to there, right? And so that's, um, that's, uh, means that all this is out of focus and anything further in the foreground is out of focus. Uh, and if you have your depth of field set that way, then your bird just floats against an empty background. Got it. Do you <clears throat> usually shoot wide open? Uh, no, you know, um, I'm, well, I, I'm using the same camera and lens almost all the time. So it's a 400 millimeter uh, F4.5. And that's mirrorless uh, uh, Sony uh, A77. It's like first mirrorless cameras. Um, and what I realized with a normal morning like this, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with ISO probably about um, 800 or so, and then I'm gonna be at 5.6. You know, 4.5 is as, as wide open as I could be, but I'll stop down a stop or two just to give myself a little depth of field, a little bit of margin for error. And the lenses are always just a bit sharper. You stop down just one or two stops and they would be wide open, right? So if there's enough light, I'll always stop down one or two stops anyway. Uh, but, um, but that's about it. Um, if you, if you, although if you're like this, you can stop down as much as you want because the background is still going to be out of focus. It's when birds are like at, at St. Augustine Alligator Farm where the background is really close. If you stop down a lot, the background becomes in focus and then that, you know, that detracts from your photo. Uh, well, yeah, and that's a picture of one of my students in one of my workshops, and, uh, and that's what I'm saying. She's laying in the mud. She's all messy and nasty. She's getting some good photos, right, because she's taking the heart. Uh, people will ask, you know, say, I can't do that, and some people can't do that, and I'm sure I'll get to the point where uh, I can't do that, and then I'll, I'll be sad, right? But, I mean, I'll show you some uh, I'll show you some pictures of the difference between shooting down and shooting at that level here in a bit. I'm sure I have some here. Uh, but there you go. Again, that's this is at Fort DeSoto. This is a snowy plover. It's been feeding a little bit. Uh, the light is softer here, so the, but you can still see the little catch light here. And no shadow. It's not a shadow anywhere on here. And the background's out of focus and the foreground's out of focus. And for me, that's the perfect portrait, right? And of course, that bird is not going to let you walk up to it. You know, I'm down and I crawl. Probably took me 10 minutes there. And sometimes you'll crawl and, uh, and they'll leave and you'll be sad because you've been <laughs> working your way, crawling, you know, and, or somebody will come and, you know, scare them. But, but uh, yeah, that's, that's my goal. Um, where do you go? So 
let's see, do you guys know Fort DeSoto County Park? It's, uh, it's popular for a couple of reasons. One reason is that migratory songbirds go through there in May and October. So they're going down, you know, during the winter and then they're coming back up now. And, uh, and you can go there and, and all along the edge of the park, there's mulberry trees and foliage and, and songbirds will come through there and you'll get, you'll see a lot of birds you don't get to see otherwise. But um, also lots and lots of good shorebirds. And there are reddish egrets there. It's like one of the places you can go. And I won't say guaranteed, but I went there probably eight or 10 times this year. And I think one day I did not see reddish egrets. So all the other times I got to photograph reddish egrets. And if you're familiar with reddish egrets, you know, those are those really cool birds with the big plumey, uh, uh, just flowing plumage. It almost gives them like a mane and they flop and thrash, you know, thrash around and, and they can't be fished where they throw their wings up and make, they, they stir up the water and then they throw up their wings to make a shadow. And then the minnows will fly up, come up under the shadow, and then they stab them, right? So they're great fun to watch, but it's a really good place to, to get rare shegrits, but lots of shorebirds too. Uh, uh, I was there this season, uh, this winter, and I probably was there on a day where there were several thousand shorebirds on the beach, shorebirds and seabirds. And I'll show you some pictures of all these. Little Estero Lagoon is, is down by um, uh, Fort Myers, and it's a, it's a place where there's mangroves surrounded lagoons, and sand surrounding green. So you get a lot of neat backgrounds. And in the stores I list here just because it's a great place to go see um, skimmers. Skimmers nest there. In fact, there's a rescue center, a seabird, shorebird rescue center, and they put out little wooden um, decoys to remind the skimmers, oh yeah, that's where we nest and the birds come and, and, and you can get nice pictures of uh, skimmers nesting. Merritt Island, you wouldn't think it was a shorebird place, but um, the other day I was, what, what you can get there, especially this time of year, are killdeer, which are really pretty, and uh, black neck stilts, and they nest on the refuge. The black neck stilts make little mud nests along the shallows, along the edge, so you just got to drive around and watch the water, and uh, killdeer will nest on the gravelly roads. They'll just nest right in the middle of the road, and, uh, and their eggs look just like gravel and and, and I think I have some photos from all these places. It's Smyrna Dunes Park, it's a, it's a big flat, nice beach area. Uh, the one thing you can get there, they have a, a rock jetty. And so you get purple sandpipers, which only feed on rocks. So when they come to Florida, you only find them near the jetties, but that's a reliable place that you can find uh, purple sandpipers. I don't know, I don't know, in the shores or that one. So let's see here. So there's Fort DeSoto County Park. It's an awesome county park. It's not run by the state. It's not a state park. It's a county park. And it is so nice. It's well organized. It's well manicured. They've got rangers there. It's got camping and picnicking and all kinds of great stuff. And two really good beaches. If you come on, if you turn left, you can go to the East Beach and get pictures of the sunrise. And then uh, do that for an hour or two. And then what I typically do is I'll drive all the way down here to North Beach and there's the lagoon and then photograph as the sun is, has gotten higher, it's starting to come over the trees that are on this green area here, and it starts lighting up the beach, and the birds will be on the beach and in the lagoons. And this year they had lots of, uh, not just shorebirds, but uh, white pelicans, several hundred white pelicans uh, hanging out uh, in this lagoonal area on this, north, on this side here. So a great place if you haven't been there, Google it, there's, what, you know, there's a Facebook page, there's websites, you'll see some of the photos. Um, great horned owls nest here. And like I say, all along this area, the, the shorebirds, uh, songbirds nest too. So what will you find there? Oyster catchers, the picture of the sleeping oyster catchers I, I took there, willets, uh, and I put asterisks here for the ones that actually will nest there. So Wilson's plovers, willets, oyster catchers, I've all photographed nesting there. There's four different types of plovers that I write for, one, two, three, five different types of plovers that you might find there. Wilson's are more common. black belly plovers are very common. Snowy plovers a little less common. semi palmated Piping plovers are probably the, the ones you at least see there. Uh, and then some really pretty birds that are just there migratory. Avocets, which are like um, just beautiful, graceful, long billed brown and white pretty birds. I, I've got pictures of many of these, but uh, so you see a great number of birds and some that actually nest there. So there's a black belly plover. <clears throat> and this one, um, 
during the winter, you went there, it would just be brown and white and the belly would be white. And this one is about three quarters of the way molting into his breeding plumage. This will become, the belly will become purely solid black. The cap is, is uh, the stripe here is white. The cap comes black. She has a beautiful bird, you know. Um, oyster catchers, and that was from Fort DeSoto, a photo. And there's a couple pair that nest there and nest on surrounding beaches. Uh, Sanderlings are everywhere. You can get those anywhere you want, but uh, they're common there. And, and there was a day, a time when there must have been a, a red tide or some sort of fish kill, and there was dead uh, scallops all over the place. And so shorebirds were, were feasting on all the uh, mollusks. Little Ostero Lagoon, it's down by Fort Myers Beach. Uh, I have a holiday in marked here. Today it's um, no longer Holiday Inn. What is it? It's a Marriott uh, Garden. It's a Garden Inn. Hilton Garden Inn. Garden Inn? Yeah. Uh, but there's the lagoon. And so what you can do, what I always do is stay there uh, at what used to be the Holiday Inn. And then uh, I stay there for three or four days and just every morning get up and walk out to the beach. And you walk out here, this first lagoon has um, mangroves around it. And then you can walk to the other side and this lagoon has just sand around it. And there's shorebirds, there's wading birds. It's just a, and then as you work down the beach, there are places where uh, Wilson's plover's nest, um, least turns nest, uh, American oyster catchers sometimes, and further down the beach, black skimmers and snowy plovers. So, you know, this time here, if you went and stayed, it's the Hilton Garden Inn, I believe it is now. It used to be the Holiday Inn, but it's right there on this uh, Gulf Boulevard, let's say Astera Boulevard. Uh, and little Astero Lagoon is right behind it. And uh, to me, best place in Florida because you have uh, lots of protected lagoons and lots of nesting birds. Uh, hey, Jack. Yes, sir. It's Joe. It's a Wyndham now. Oh, it's a Wyndham. Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks so much, Wyndham. Yeah, Wyndham Garden. So I know they still call it a garden. Excellent. Appreciate that. Uh, and so I've asterisked the ones that nest there. And like I said, oyster catchers, not all time, but when you get oyster catchers and oyster catcher babies together, boy, that is cool. Uh, Wilson plovers, snowy plovers for sure. And, uh, and the seabirds, do I, I, don't, I don't list all the seabirds, but there's always a, um, I'm having a brain fart now. Skimmers, yeah, black skimmers uh, nesting there too. Wimbrel, so this is a, a large shorebird, a long curved bill. There's another, it's migratory, you don't see it here most of the year, but they're there uh, during the um, winter here. And now they, they've headed out, they, they nest further north. Uh, there's one of those snowy plover chicks. I mean, wouldn't you want, want to get a photo like that, right? I mean, of course, right? And so snowy plovers, Wilson plover, all those plovers, they're like little, what do you call it, cot swabs, right? They're just the little sticks with a ball of cotton on top of them. That was pretty easy. Right. Yeah, no, there. That's not an easy <laughs> photograph. That's that's like good luck because they're they're little cot swabs that run 100 miles an hour. So uh -huh. you kind of just look for where they're foraging, and then lay in the sand and hope they run up and stop and look at you. You know, it, it can be, yeah, it can be frustrating, but when you get them, you know, it's great. What settings would have you used for that for the speedy little bird like that? Yeah, well, because uh, I don't try to photograph them when they're running, and I have photographed them when they're running, but it's not nearly as neat, you know, a photo. But uh, uh, so it's, it, it would be dependent on the light. I'm probably at 5.6. It's still pretty early in the morning. So I'm probably at ISO, maybe 400, something like that, you know. I try to keep the ISOs. Uh, I never go higher than 1250 if I can help it. I'm, I mean, just almost, just never. I mean, if there was a dragon, you know, on, a, on the beach or something, I might go higher because, you know, how often are you going to see a dragon on the beach? But otherwise that I figure I want to, I want to get a good resolution and less grain. So I'm never going too high, but in terms of F-stop and, um, and shutter speed, the F-stop would be 5.6, 6.3, because it's just one small bird. So the depth of field doesn't have to be great. And then the, the shutter speed will just be dependent on what the light is, but probably at least uh, you know, I'm thinking 800 or 1,000. Right. And then the least turns, and, you know, this is a, a real young one, but the, the least turns are flying in and out. They're feeding their babies. The little least turns, when they get a little bigger, will run around the beach. 
and, and chase, you know, every bird that flies in with a minnow, they'll run up and you can get them exchanging and, and getting fed. So, but they nest there. You can definitely get this photo or something similar, right? Uh, and so there's the Seaside Seabird Sanctuary. And it's, this is also Reddington beaches here, but Indian shores. Um, I would go to this place, park, and just walk out to the beach. And if you go there June, July, you'll find, you know, that. And so, you know, that's worth the trip, right? And, and they're very, they're right on the beach and it's cordoned off and there's people running up down the beach and, and, and the birds are not disturbed. So, so you can get really good photos of uh, all kinds of interesting action, birds being fed, you know, moms with two or three babies tucked under them and all that good stuff. And I'll just say this while I'm looking at this photo, you notice the light is golden too. This is early, you see the, the glimmer in all their eyes. So that's the, that's the kind of light I'm looking for. And backgrounds out of focus, foregrounds out of focus. And of course I'm laying there with my camera almost in the sand, you know, at eye, eye level with a bird that's only four inches off the sand. Uh, yeah, and there you go. So mom has uh, brought a uh, needlefish and, uh, and they're now the young ones are, you can see the dirt flying. They're, they're having a good time trying to figure out uh, who gets to eat the needlefish. Uh, I've got a picture of one of these guys who has won the battle and swallowed the needlefish. And the needlefish is as long as the skimmer. So he's walking around and the tail's hanging out of his mouth. And for like 20 minutes, he walked around as he slowly digested it before he finally got it completely down. Yeah, you know, so just, that's all you get it in your shores, but it's worth the ride because there's all kinds of cuteness there to be had. Uh, and then Merritt Island, and like I say, it's a, uh, let's see, if you've not been there, you can go down I-95, there's 95, and you take this 406 exit, and you just drive through Titusville, and you drive into uh, Merritt Island. You can go drive all the way through it, and you can go out to the beach, but I, I rarely ever do that. I usually uh, take this little fork here, and go to Black Point Wildlife Drive and drive that a lot. And, and it's mostly, I go there mostly during the winter because there's lots of water there. And during the winter, during the dry season, the water starts drying up and it's just little tiny ponds with lots of fish concentrated in there. So birds, wading birds will come there by the hundreds and all be foraging, fit, feeding together in the ponds. But if you wanna get some interesting shorebirds, there are some there too. Uh, this list, the ones that nest there, and there aren't many, uh, but black neck stilts and killdeer both nest there. Uh, there's the avocet, the American avocet, just, you know, beautiful, graceful bird. And they, they're migratory. They're only through here for a week or two, but sometimes at Merritt Island, you'll see them for most of the winter. They don't maybe get any further south than Merritt Island. Uh, black neck stilts, that's what a nest looks like, just a chunk of rotten vegetation. And the stilts will be pretty obvious because they'll they'll be walking around here picking up sticks and manicuring, and you just have to drive around and look for anything that looks like a little clump, and, and keep your eyes out to see if the stilts are there. But um, one of the places that fairly reliable you can get this summer photos, and this is the time of year to do it. Uh, and that's a baby killdeer, and uh, this parent nested in the middle of a gravel road. And the rangers spotted the nest and they put orange cones around it so that people who were using the gravel roads wouldn't run over it. And then when the babies were born, well, either the side of the gravel road was a canal. So there was just gravel road, a little bit of grass and stuff on either side of the canal. So the babies were born, they didn't have a lot of room to, to, to flee. So I was able to lay in the middle of the road and just get this picture of the, of the baby killed there along the side of the road there. Pretty cute. Baby shorebirds, you know, you can't beat them. And Smyrna Dunes Park, so New Smyrna Beach, you go down 995 and what is it, 44, maybe I'm not sure, but but you can find uh, New Smyrna uh, Dunes Park and you can drive across Causeway and go over here and there's a park here and there is, doesn't show the jetties here, but there's jetties here and along those jetties, so there's big white sand beaches with normal shorebird photos, but also on the jetties, you get birds on the rocks including those purple sandpipers. Um, so again, a list of the different birds you see there. And a lot of these are the same birds you would see at Anastasia, except you get the purple sandpipers, which uh, only place I've seen them. 
And that's what they look like. They don't look very purple here, but kind of getting getting toward a little bit of that color. When they get into more breeding colors, they get more reddish purple. But a kind of pretty spotted bird and and uh, and getting a reddish purple bill. And you don't see them anywhere else except on the rocks. So that's kind of cool because now you have something besides sand. Bird on the sand, you get birds on the rocks, and sometimes they'll be um, bathing in little puddles as well. Uh, and there's a ready turnstone, and that's again one of the puddles that has formed, accumulated on top of the, the boulders and the jetty. Uh, and, you know, just, I guess, uh, showing you a variety of birds that you see there. To me, the purple sandpiper is, uh, is like, if you haven't photographed those and you want to, that's where you can go to do it. Again, and this is just showing you my, the same deal, right? The background's out of focus, foreground's out of focus. I'm laying in the sand in my belly. The light is kind of golden here and, you know, that's, that's what I'm hoping to do with shorebirds most of the time. So let's talk about uh, maybe identifying shorebirds a little bit. Not that there's a, a magic trick to doing it. You know, I don't have any, I can just sort of give you some general idea about the different shorebirds you're liable to see. And those are the different things that will help you. One of the things is location, you know, um, these days, because of the internet, every place you want to go, you can look up Fort DeSoto and you're going to see all the photos that people have taken. And you're going to say, oh, there was Wimbrels there. In fact, the Wimbrels that I saw this year, I went there and I went directly to where they were at because someone had been posting photos there for, for a week or two on the Fort DeSoto uh, website. And they said, yeah, there's two of them and they're hanging around by the Gulf Pier. So I went to North Beach and when I got done, I went to Gulf Pier and there was two Wimbrels there and, and I got photographs of the Wimbrels. So um, I found Wimbles because I expected to find Wimbles because I had done some research and knew that Wimbles were there. So even if you didn't know what a Wimble looks like, go to the website and go, oh, that's the kind of big bird with the curved bill. Now I know what to look for. So I was, you know, you can identify birds based upon what you expect to see, what's been reported there. Size is a good thing. Um, size, uh, there's three different categories, kind of small uh, shorebirds, some that are a little little in between and then some, uh, just a few large ones. And I'll show you what I mean by those sizes. Behavior will tell you a lot. If you see shorebird on the beach and the wave comes in and the shorebird runs from the wave and then follows the wave down and runs back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you know, that's a sanderling because that's what they do. They're little grayish, brownish birds and the only shorebird that does that. And a lot of times they're in flocks of five or 10 or 15 or 20, but that's how they feed. They run and the wave goes, they peck into the wet sand and then they run from the wave and they go back and forth and the Saturday. If you see a bird walking down the beach and he's got sort of a triangle sh shaped bill and he's just flipping everything in sight, turning stuff over, it's a ruddy turnstone because that's what they do. They turn stones, they turn shells. So their behavior uh, can be a, a good key, especially when you, you can spot a bird hundred feet away and just see how he's moving and go, oh yeah, that's a turnstone because there he goes, turning, turning everything over. And the parents, you know, that's familiarity. A lot of times I'll, if, uh, I'll photograph a bird and have to go back and look it up. But once I've seen them enough, then you start getting used to the, uh, not just the color patterns, but just the general outline, even the bill size. These two guys have different size bills. I don't know if you can see that, but Wilson Plover, much bigger bill than the Snowy Plover. Otherwise, you think, well, they're pretty similar. That's kind of light brown. He's kind of dark brown. They look the same otherwise, but much more robust bill on the Wilson's plover. All right, let's see. Yeah, and, and in terms of, of location, I said internet. Uh, Florida has the Great Florida Birding and Wildlife Trail and that website, and it lists a couple of hundred different locations. It's not really a trail. It's just different locations, and everywhere each of those locations has a sign that has this logo on it. And you can look up the website and it will tell you what's found at that particular location. And it's organized into four different areas along the, along the uh, state. And, and, and so you can go to like, well, South Florida, and you can look at all the places. You can find places nearby you on the map. It's okay, I'll try that place. And you'll know what's going to be there because of the reports that are listed here. Websites, like I said, social media. If you know what you might be there, then it's easier to identify what you see when you do see it. 
And in our list, there's lots of words here, so this doesn't help you much, but let me just show you some pictures. Look, there's large ones, there's only a couple of large ones, there's some middle-sized ones, there's a lot of small ones. Um, so the big ones. So there's really only three shorebirds that I would classify as large. And by that, I would say 12, 14 inches tall when they're, when they're upright. And the one you see all the time is uh, um, at Fort DeSoto during the winter is the Marble Godwit. And this one is starting to get into his breeding colors. They're not quite as orange and red as that, but as they get more and more in breeding colors. But it's a big shorebird and the bill curves up. And that's a marbled Godwit. And, and that's all you need to know. It's uh, the bill is really beautifully pink. And uh, oh, what's that? Anyway, you might get to recognize a pattern eventually. But if it's a foot tall and it has a curved up bill, that's a marbled Godwit. If you see one that's a foot tall and it has a long downward curved bill, I mean a long bill, then you know you have a long bill curlew. And it's uh, this bird literally has, according to what I've read, the longest bill of any bird on the planet relative to its body size. Right? No bird has a bill longer than that uh, based upon its you know, percentage of body size. But anyway, so if you see a really long downturn bill, long billed curlew. And then the Wembrel is a bit like the long billed curlew. It has more distinctive stripes on its head, but the bill is not quite as long. So those are the big ones. Uh, all three of these I've seen at Fort DeSoto. Um, and all three of these I've seen at um, Little Estero Lagoon. I can't say you'll always find them there. long billed curlews are probably the rarest of the three. Uh, medium size. So Willet's probably the most common medium size, uh, maybe a couple of inches shorter than the, than the curlews, but uh, really common if you see a big, big Short bird working along the shorelines, uh, chances are it's a willet. Kildare, they're not gonna be on the beach, but they're, they're plovers, but they're bigger than any other plover, but very distinctive. So I think if you spot a Kildare once or twice, you'll recognize them by these beautiful black and white stripes and the red, red circle around his eyes. And that's full breeding plumage too. Oyster catchers, they're unmistakable. They're one of the bigger, bigger more robust bodies. And then yellow legs, obviously yellow legs are gonna be the key there. There are actually two species. There's a lesser and there's a greater. And the only way I can tell, they, they say there's a difference in the length of the bill. Uh, but when I see one of them individually, I never know what it is. Uh, I just have to photograph it and go back and look. And if the bill's upturned, and I think a little bit longer, it's a, it's a greater. But when I'm photographing, typically I'll just photograph it and say, I know it's a yellow legs. Maybe I'll be able to figure out which it is later. The best way is to get a, a lesser and a greater next to each other in your photo, and then you know, hey, I, I think I know which is which. Um, plovers, so we have these five plovers. Uh, most common is the Wilson's plover. Uh, you have those on the beach near you, I'm sure. Uh, kind of a robust bill, uh, a little taller. Uh, these two look very, very similar. The difference between the snow and the piping, the one easy, easy characteristic to identify the difference is the legs. Snow is gray. And the piping is the only one of these guys with yellow legs. I keep showing the black belly plover with a black belly and the black because to me that's just so beautiful. This one is still not quite in his full breeding plumage. If you saw him during the winter here, it would look like that. You know, it, these colors just magically begin to appear. And then there's another semi palmated plover. And they have a little tiny orange, little tiny bill, the smallest bill with just a little red spot, little orange spot on the bill there. So that's a uh, the way you can spot those if you can get close enough to see that spot. And uh, yeah, lots of small ones. And you know, mostly the way I identify the small ones is I take the picture and go back and, and look. Um, <clears throat> um, whoops, excuse me. Is this, a, this is a done one, I guess here. Let me see what I've got here. I've got stuff in my way here. Yeah, Dunlin. Let me move some of these things here. So that Dunlin, uh, it's a little brown jobber that you would not be able to identify. You wouldn't be able to distinguish from anybody else during the winter. But when he starts putting on his breeding colors, they get this black spot. And then you know it's a Dunlin. There's a Sanderling. He looks like a little brown jobber. And the best way I can tell you with the Sanderling is he's always on the move. The least, least uh, sandpipers. Tiny, tiny, tiny. You photograph a shorebird and it's so tiny, 
just like a hummingbird, not much bigger than a hummingbird, you know, then you've got a leaf sandpiper. Purple sandpiper is the spots and the location. You, you just don't see them on the sand much. And then a ruddy turnstone, here's one breeding, moving into his breeding colors, but they have this sharp triangular bill and they're flipping stuff over. I mean, that's how you're gonna recognize a ruddy turnstone. They become little brown jobbers too. This black goes away. They just have light brown backs and white bellies. This is a great time to go out and photograph shorebirds because everybody's putting on the breeding colors, getting ready to migrate north to the breeding grounds. Uh, and then seabirds. So by seabirds, there's really the black skimmers. There's several varieties of terns. Terns are different from gulls in that the terns almost always have this black cap. Uh, this is a least tern, bright yellow bill. Uh, black skimmers, I think probably most of you know about black skimmers, but very unique birds in that they feed while they're flying, skim the top of the water, have this long extended bill that, that dips into the water. And they literally fly along with their bill in the water until they hit a fish and they snag it and fly away. And sometimes if you're clicking, photographing, you'll get the moment when they hit the fish. And then they look like they almost fly over, you know, their body just flips over because it's such an impact. I just don't, can't see how that's a great way to make a living, but that's what they do. It's pretty crazy. And then we have several different types of gulls. The two most common are the ring bill gulls and the black bill, um, laughing gulls. I think might have some more pictures of those too. Uh, but yeah, I'm so saying about behavior. So there's a ruddy turnstone and that one's not quite, let's see, go back here. Yeah, so he's starting to put on his black and has more breeding plumage. This one hasn't done so much of that yet, but he's flipping stuff over. And I guess I really put this photo here um, to mention a very distinctive feeding behavior, but also to show you again, what I like about laying down. I'm laying in the water here. I don't have anything in my pockets, in my front pockets, because my belly and my pants, I'm, I'm all wet. And the water's only an inch deep, but you know, whatever, it's like, water so it's not hurting me and uh the background is out of focus in fact nothing's in focus you get a you know foreground the bird is just floating isolated um uh, in its own little world uh, in the frame because because i'm really low but anyway you spot turnstones obviously because they're turning habits the way they move dunlin not only develop that black belly but when they're in non-breeding plumage they look like a uh, sewing machine like that and they're usually in, in flocks as well. And then the different habitats, some are down by the waves, some are further up on the beach. And a lot of that becomes uh, familiarity with the beach you're going to, or that particular bird, you know where they will be. <clears throat> and then sometimes you learn the calls. Oyster catchers have a very distinct sort of shrill call. Killdeer do as well. And so you'll hear the calls. A lot of times um, I'll be alerted to the appearance of oyster catchers on the beach because as they fly in, they're making their very distinct calls. And you could Google that if you wanted to, but once you get used to the, uh, once you go to a place where you see them, you'll, you'll begin to recognize those calls. Uh, yeah, so the appearance right there's, anybody know what that is? Uh, long build, cool. yeah. Big bird, you can't tell the size here, but that bill's the giveaway, right? Nobody else has a bill like that. So immediately you see that. And of course, they'd be big too. They would catch your eye because they're, they're 12 or 14 inches tall when they're stretched out. Uh, color is not so good during the winter, but during the breeding season, the spring, you move in the summer, boy, it becomes really good. And then that bill sh shape and size. I wouldn't have to see anything but that long bill. I might be 100 yards away and see there's a big bird and look at, look at that bill. That's a curve. Let me get over there. Let me start getting in the right light. All right, so what can I tell you about shorebirds that I haven't said today in my little flash to shorebirds? What are your questions? So if you are on, I, I've done this before. I've gone to Anastasia Island and got into the beach park uh, at the main entrance. And I guess you're kind of near the pier and you start walking north. And, and I haven't been there in a while, but I know sometimes there's a wave, wave cut terrace. And so I'll walk along there and I'll, I'll uh, look, see if there's birds on top of that terrace. And I've seen least terns and Wilson plovers nesting there. And then I'll just keep walking and keep walking. And pretty soon you get up further 
past where the general public is willing to walk. And you can walk all the way to the end if you're in for a little bit of a hike and find some pretty neat birds up there. And a lot of times there'll be large flocks of birds in the um, tidal pools along, along the uh, beach there. So if I was close to you, and then uh, Joe, well, what is it, Summerhaven, right? Summerhaven is where you can go to get these guys. Le this is a baby Lee's turn. And I think Joe, Joe, have you been there yet? Well, Summerhaven's pretty much gone. Is it? They, they built there, rebuilt it. Um, I guess I was up, um, they kind of repopulated up next to the St. Augustine Pier. The least oh. turns up there. I was up there with Bobby the other day. Oh, okay. So they're, they're much closer. Then. So have they got it cordoned off? Yeah, they've got it all cordoned off. There's a little dirt road next to, I think it's at a light too next to the pier. And it's really just a little short walk and you just kind of go up there and park yourself and just wait for the action to happen. And do you, can you get between the water and the nests so that you get the sun behind you? Let's see, they've got them cornered off up next to the sand dunes, and you can get to the water, but mm -hmm. it seems like when we were there the other day, they were mostly hanging up by the sand dunes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there you go. There's a place. Uh, uh, that's the kind of floater you get. That's, of course, a little least turn running around calling for He's heard his mom, and I don't know how they distinguish whose mom is whose, but. <clears throat> but um, and then, Huguenot, have you, Joe, have you been to Huguenot Beach Park? You know, I haven't been up there for a while. I was supposed to teach a class up there for um, the Jacksonville group, and then COVID hit, and that kind of mm -hmm. yeah. killed all that. But. So I don't know what's happening there this season, but it's a dead, if I was you guys and I lived that. You said thousands of birds everywhere. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, great place to, to check out. In terms so, of so Jack, if, if you have not been up here in a while, uh, what you described coming up from the pier, the problem is, uh, well, there's a huge embassy suites uh, that where the old, uh, there used to be like an old uh, hotel there. Uh -huh. And they've taken that over and it's uh, like a 300 uh, room embassy suites uh, resort. Now, if you go north of there, you can still get on to the uh, to the Anastasia State Park and and get up to the inlet. So, yeah, and that's what I always did. I always yeah. usually started walking north to get away from the crowds. Right. See, there, there's an access road right next to the Embassy Suites. It's just a little dirt road. <coughs> There's probably parking in there for probably about fifteen or twenty cars, and you can park there and walk right out to the beach. So. Um, if you guys haven't been to Fort DeSoto Park, or you haven't been to Little Estero Lagoon, then um, the Wyndham Inn, like uh, Joe was saying, you know, it's renamed, but it's the Wyndham Garden Inn, uh, is not a wonderful hotel necessarily, but the access is awesome because you can park there and never leave the place and walk right out mornings and walk right out, right out evenings and be on the beach. And, and there's nesting shorebirds and there's lagoons and there's waiters. Shegert's there, <clears throat> so a great place to check out. And Fort DeSoto is the, another great place. Fort DeSoto has, um, as you go into Fort DeSoto, you're on a little causeway island called Tierra Verde. Oh, uh, hotel there that uh, Marriott uh, Resident Inn that you can stay in. That's very COVID uh, aware. They're being they're doing a really good job. In fact, when we stayed there, they cleaned the room, then they put like a big seal on the door. Nobody gets to go in there. And then you break the seal and you go in. Nobody enters the room the whole time you're there. And so we went, my wife and I went and stayed and we, we weren't comfortable yet doing that kind of stuff, but because they had made these tremendous precautions that we wouldn't have to interact with anybody, you know, and worry about getting infected. Yeah, yeah you talked you talk me into coming over there with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that worked out good. And uh, there's lagoons and shorebirds and wading birds and and I think Joe was coming over to find reddish egrets, and I said you can't guarantee it. And I think did you? But you actually eventually got the reddish egret too, didn't you, Joe? Yeah, I finally got I finally found got a photograph of big red. <laughs> yeah, so that's a good thing. Um, so those two places. I mean, there it's a, a trip, so it'd be more than a day trip. It'd be a weekend for you guys. But but if you haven't been to those two places, I'd highly recommend them. And uh, that's kind of all I got to say about shorebirds tonight. Unless you have any other questions, Jack. Question yes, for you, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Huguenot, that's up there by Mayport. Is that correct? Um, yeah, it's uh, well, 
Mayport. Across the St. John's River. It's it's on the other side, right? Okay, great. Yeah, I, I know where it is. I've never been in there, but uh, thanks for pointing that out. I'll take a look because I I'm a little bit closer there. I live over in Jacksonville area rather than uh, St. Augustine. Oh, good. Appreciate yeah, well, Google it. You know, Google it, and you'll. They, I, I bet they have a Facebook page too. You know. I don't know if but I'm looking at the map right now, so with uh, easy access, looks like a great shot. Can you can do. Uh, drive. Well, the 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 way I first became aware of it was when I was driving up even further north to go to uh, what are those two little beaches that uh, have all the dead, dead, um, dead wood. That's, That's big, that? big and little tablet islands. No. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so I stopped at Huguenot on the way and because uh, it just looked like it had some promise. And what I saw was cars floating away at high tide. They let you <laughs> yeah. and, and, uh, and those idiots get out there and they just, stay till the tide takes their car into the ocean it's like well looking at it it looks like there's hard pack out for a good part of this thing i can park in there and then uh uh i've i've i've, I've walked uh anastasia island i'm an old infantry grunt so uh oh, yeah. here doesn't, doesn't bother me in the least and getting down right. that's the big biggest piece that i take out of what you've you've shared with us today is getting low so i think yeah. that's excellent appreciate that insight sure yeah the, somebody asked me uh, well, uh, the questions I've had before is like, well, what do you do uh, when you get salt water on your camera? And my only answer was, well, don't put your camera in the salt water. You know, you just have to get used to uh, maneuvering your body and being careful about that. And that's not usually an issue. But what I always do, too, and I didn't say this, is I have a very fine bristle paintbrush that's oh. in a backpack. And, you know, all that dust that blows everywhere and gets in everything. Well, as soon as I get done each time I'm on the beach, I brush off all the sand out of every little crevice in my camera and my lenses and my tripod and all that stuff. Your 400 millimeter, that's a fixed lens? Yeah, the, the, uh, I have two lenses that I use all the time and both of them are, you know, most time folks will do 500 or even a bigger, you know, but because I like to be able to get up and down and be active and move a bit, I settled in on a 400. So I have a, uh, this 400 prime lens, but I also have now a, uh, 70 to 400 Sony zoom, which is like perfect for the alligator form because sometimes you're much closer than you want, you know, with a 400, yeah. right? <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, those are the ones I use. It just allowed me to be like, and, and the camera I have has a uh, crop sensor. So even though it's 400, it's acting like a 600, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, what else? Anything else? All right. Well, I'm going to let you guys do whatever else you guys are going to do. Then. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, my Thank pleasure, you. guys. My pleasure. Very good. Thank you. See us in person sometime. Yeah, yeah. We will. Uh, now that things are, I don't know if anything's going to ever normal, but you know, yeah, I'll be glad to do it. Let's see if I can get out of this thing now. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate it. I'll just get out of here completely. We'll see you Thanks, guys. Camera Club for putting this together. Yeah. Take care, Dad. Yeah. Bye now. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Here's my question to the remaining people on the forum. What is his secret to getting down and then getting up? <laughs> you know, it is true that you need to get eye level when you're taking photos like of animals, birds, or whatever. But I just have a hard time getting in my belly, crawling around like a snake, and then getting up again. <laughs> uh, Tim, he used to be in the Marines. And I think he learned to crawl there. And uh, but I went when I started to take the workshop with him. I emailed a person I knew that had taken the workshop before, and the first thing she said to me was, "Wear old clothes." So, oh yeah, uh, you usually well, need I, to I change. I have taken pictures of shoreline birds before, and I have put on my uh, my rain gear, just my rain gear and all, because I do get wet and so forth, but. It's getting harder and harder to get down and get up. No lie. Yeah. Take you got to take me with you, Tim. 
I'll help I'm you sorry. out. I'll help oh. you get up. <laughs> oh, what I know. Of, <laughs> what kind of um, little tripod or how you stabilize the camera? You can't hold 500 by hand all the time. Somebody does. I can't. He's got a ground pod, Vicky. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's a little, um, he's got a the head from a thing on a, on a sort of a Frisbee type thing. Okay. It's, yeah. That he holds Something the camera Something special. With. Something yeah, special. It's, only, it's only about a foot tall. Yeah, I have one of those too, but you still got to get down <laughs> and set it. Even an articulating um, back screen helps. I mean, but you still got to get down. Yeah. I have to I settle for my knees most of the time. Yeah, I use baby crawl. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. It was a great meeting. I, I enjoy the pictures, enjoy really talk. Thank you. Welcome. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. So. Oh, just before I sign off, Larissa, that I watched the video, the YouTube video of lighting, because I was, I think I was state or something. I couldn't make that session. That was a very, very, very good um, video on lighting. Mm -hmm. The, the two-step, you know, ambient light background and then the flash. Yeah. And, yeah, and lighting a always job. fascinated me with lights and so forth. But very good. Thanks for putting that on. You're welcome. Okay, guys. Yeah, I think we had a good good number of people tonight. It's did we have a good, how many did we have, Teresa? I think it was up to 28 total. Okay. Between 26 and 28, okay. I think. Okay, good. I saw 26 at one time, yeah. Yeah. And Tim, right. we got Mr. McCullough, I think it is. Yeah, Tim, you, uh, uh, sports yeah. Okay. Um, anything else you need from me, Michael? No, oh, ma'am. Good to see you all. Okay. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.